Welcome and thank you for joining us on It Is Written Canada. Today we're going to be talking to Maurice Hines, who is the retail manager at the Sprouted Oven here in Abbotsford, British Columbia. So welcome, Maurice. My pleasure. Thanks and for having me. Do we look forward to your sharing with us today. Tell us a little bit about your work to begin with. Yeah, so as a retail manager, um, we have a plant-based facility that we provide um, uh, grains, flowers, breads. Um, for those who are in interested in plant-based living, uh, we provide uh, basically everything that you need. Mm -hmm. Healthy living. Healthy living. Mm -hmm. Maurice, can you briefly take us back to your childhood where your life and dreams first started and where all of it began? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I was born in Jamaica and uh, just the greatest life ever. You know, just the tropics, running around, playing. Um, really good experience um, but when I was 10 it's strange enough I, I had these three life goals um, uh, to have a bicycle to um, take karate and to become a pilot to uh, fly an airplane and so not quite sure what the motivation was but um, uh, I, that's how it started um, had a great childhood loved every moment so you had three goals you wanted to own your own bicycle do karate and be a pilot. So that's correct. When did you get your bicycle? Yeah. So um, as uh, at fifteen, I moved to Ontario uh, with my family, and um, shortly after, when I was sixteen, I got my first bike. It was uh, amazing, and um, it was a mountain bike, and I rode all over all over the city. Just loved it. So you were pretty serious about biking. I remember your uncle once told me that, and. What about the karate? Were you as serious about that? Right. So uh, shortly after, um, we, uh, I was in a, a plaza and I noticed uh, a sign mm -hmm. that said uh, karate lessons here. And I said, fantastic. So my second goal, it was re reminded me of my second goal. Mm -hmm. And then I um, joined up and it was uh, basically advertising for a six month program uh -huh. six months that's and I thought perfect that's uh -huh. all I need six months um, no so I was not serious about it It was not a lifetime goal uh, per se you know it was just something I needed to I just wanted to learn how to kick and punch uh -huh. and to um, to have fun with it how did that change well that changed uh, from a six-month commitment to, um, uh, to a year and a half but uh, what happened was um, after about three or four months into the program, mm -hmm. uh, one day I, um, I was, uh, as I entered the class, uh, I was asked to go see my sensei. I walked into his office and, and um, he said, Maurice, we're running a, a campaign right now where you can become a lifetime member of this organization, um, through this karate organization. And I, I basically said, oh, well, thank you so much for the offer, but I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the six month program was really all I needed mm -hmm. and I'm quite happy with that. And he was very polite, said, okay, thank you so much. Okay, go ahead and finish class, have a good day. So about an hour later, um, I get another message. Sensei wants to see you again. Okay, I thought that was pretty odd. I was just there an hour ago. So I walk in, I close the door and he said, have a seat. And uh, I don't know what happened, but the next thing I know, I was sitting in the chair and I came out of uh, what seemed like a trance with a pen in my hand and I was signing the lifetime membership application. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's still <laughs> weird. It's been over 30 years and it's still weird. It's like mind blowing weird. Um, and that began a series of really interesting events and I became more involved. 
mm-hmm. than I really wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you stuck to that. What was your philosophy? Yeah, so our philosophy was uh, whatever it takes to get it done. And so one of the things that we adopted was a very strict lifestyle. I lived out of a day timer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a day timer where I had daily goals, I had weekly goals, two week goals, one month goals, three month goals, six month goals, one year goals, five year goals. Wow. I lived out of this day timer. And if you wanted to talk to me, um, and uh, I, y- there was a slot that I was doing something, you had to book a special time to meet with me, even if you just wanted to have a simple conversation. So all of those are, are really good things, having goals, having sticking you know, to a, a strict um, lifestyle that's gonna be healthy. What was your motive? Our motive was to, to become a god, is to have a great karma, to come back as, um, yeah, okay. mm-hmm. as someone famous, great. Mm-hmm. Well, with, How do you see that now that you're, that you're a Christian? I mean, you weren't a Christian then. That's right. I, I wasn't uh, raised in a Christian home. Mm-hmm. I had no Christian affiliation. Um, we just did whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, we, there was no no guidelines, restrictions, or anything like that mm-hmm. at all. But you wanted to come back as, a, your whole philosophy was to come back as a God, so it was all about you. That's right, you know, and, and now as a Christian, you know, I look back, absolutely, that's all it was. And, you know, there's a, there's a verse here in Jeremiah I'd like to share, mm-hmm. uh, Jeremiah 17, um, a few verses, five, uh, seven and nine, and five says, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and make it flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. In verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord, and whose hope is in the Lord. Verse 9, a very familiar one. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. And that's where I was. We, we, we were really caught up into this mindset that we could save ourselves. And, and one of the things that early in my experience that brought that about was uh, one day Sensei lined us all up, which he did every day. But he lined us up and rather than starting the class, he asked us the question, who do you believe in? Starting from the lowest belt to the senior belt. And everyone gave their answer all along the line. And he got to the senior belt and the senior belt said, I believe in me. Sensei looked at us and said, that's what I want you all to say. Mm. And we started this journey thinking and trusting only in ourselves and only what we could accomplish. Mm. So you're doing a lot of fighting here. Um, Did you ever get injured? Did you ever experience a lot of pain? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, you know. um, It takes uh, a lot of hours to to, uh, become proficient in anything. And uh, yeah, we we would get hurt. Uh, We would get bruises. Um, One particular event, I remember clearly, I was at a tournament Mm -hmm. in a large city in Ontario. And um, I had gone through, at my belt level, we had gone through about, I've gone through about half of the contestants. Um, But by then I'd broken both my big toes. They Mm -hmm. were completely jammed, completely broken, just excruciating pain. Mm. I went to Sensei, I found him in the crowd and I said, Sensei, um, I've broken my toes, I can't continue. He turned around, looked at me, just as, as if nothing happened. And he said, are you still in the competition? Because the way it was set up was if you, every time, if you sparred and you lost, you would just be down for the day. You became a spectator for the mm-hmm. rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Enjoy it that way. And I said, no, I haven't lost a fight. And he said, okay, forget the pain. And so when he told me that, it wasn't a foreign thought to me because we were trained Whenever we got hurt or had pain, we went into what was called, a, we called the white light meditation. Um, but either we lay down or we went into the, st- the typical Buddhist sitting position. So when it came to pain or trauma, um, that's how we dealt with it. Uh-huh. For, so for the whole period I was involved in martial arts, I never had a cold, a sniffle, anything. Mm. I would go, as you can see, I'm of dark complexion, and I would go sometimes into the change room with my friends and I would take my shirt off and there would be literal fist marks left on my body. There'd be imprints a foot, a, a foot on my chest. Wow. You could still see it, but there was no pain. No pain. Wow. No pain. Yeah. So you had a lot of these experiences where you did these mega training. 
You want to talk about that? Yeah, mega trainings. Mega trainings were like a boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would train for 24 hours. We would go for two hours and have a 10, 15 minute break. And uh, through all that, we would um, we'd do certain things, uh, specific things. And uh, around three in the morning, we would get into uh, a lot of Buddhist philosophy. And uh, for the most people, as you know, around two, three in the morning, you're not really clear on anything. You're <laughs> pretty foggy and you're just dying to sleep. But and that's how it was. And, and that's when we would have all the, the philosophies on, on Buddhism. So you weren't thinking deeply. No. It was kind of just coming at you. That's right. We were basically like uh, SpongeBob. We were okay. just soaking <laughs> everything up. Whatever it came, we, we embraced it. And, uh, and there was other, other uh, times where we, we had um, uh, what we called a, uh, the elevator talk, where we would go through an exercise where you'd start at the 10th floor and you'd pass out. And uh, around the fifth floor, you had no idea what was going on. And you got to the ground floor then you'd be awakened. But all that time, your sensei was talking to you mm. um, through the whole experience. And it was all being taken in. And it was all taken hmm. How did you know if you were on his wavelength? Yeah. And so he demonstrated that very clearly for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in class one day in particular, and uh, I was sparring. Literally felt like the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I just paused, stopped and looked around to see what was going on. And there was my sensei smiling. And he just called me over. And uh, as I went to him, he said, I just want to see if you're on my wavelength. Mm. And he said, just stand here. And he turned around and did the same thing to uh, another colleague of mine. Um, and I was just mind blown. I mean, the stories go on and on. I, I can tell you so many interesting things that r started to let me really think about what I was doing. But I, because I didn't have a religious background, I didn't have any other support system. There was really no one I could talk to about it. Mm -hmm. It, Even though it seemed weird, but you accepted it as this is a mm -hmm. norm because initially in the early stages when I was thinking about, you know, thinking about killing people all the time, I'd spoken to my friend and uh, and he said it was normal. Mm. Like, this is what we do. This is just how we thinking th about killing people all the this time. This is how we think. This yeah. is how we, uh, we function. and. Um, so, so Maurice, listening to you speaking like this, would you say that karate was a spiritual experience for you or a religious experience for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a religious experience <laughs> because uh, I would, we would spend certain classes, quite a few, as I continued to grow in, in the whole process. We would sit, a class would be consisting of sitting in the dark with candles and meditating. Mm that would be the whole class. And I got very involved. I was uh, teaching classes of my own, mm -hmm. um, other white belts. I was teaching white belts or younger classes, lots of little kids. We had lots of little kids that would be part of this club. And um, I was involved uh, with a few of my colleagues teaching at a local high school. School, I would be teaching grade nine self-defense classes. Mm -hmm. And some of your fighting was in the dark, or with your hand tied behind your back, yes. or with a blindfold on. Yes. How'd you do that? Yeah, so the philosophy behind that was to develop a um, never quit attitude. <laughs> and so we were trained to fight with our arms tied behind us, um, blindfolded, uh, feet tied together. So all the different scenarios, not all the same. Um, so we'd have feet tied, or hands would be free, or, or hands would be tied, or feet would be free, mm -hmm. um, or blindfolded, and both your hands and feet would be free. And so it made you learn to adapt mm -hmm. to all your senses became heightened. So you didn't just see anymore, now you could hear. You could hear things that you wouldn't hear before. Mm -hmm. You'd feel things that you never felt before. And mm -hmm. so every sense became super heightened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where was the turning point for you? The turning point for me, was um, I remember a Sunday, <clears throat> my uncle hmm. and aunt, they owned a uh, um, stationary supply store in a mall. And they asked me, can you cover the store for us? Can you cover the store for us one day, the Sunday? And I said, sure. Okay, I can do it. You know, um, check your calendar, check your schedule. 
And uh, so uh, this particular store was right across from uh, one of those old video stores that had these monitors and screens. And this kid came along, I think had to be 10, 12, 13. Um, and he stood right in front of one of the screens that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, it troubled me. And I, of course, I, you know, I thought, fine, I can take care of this right now. So I basically just went into a slight meditation. Uh, of course, I can't explain all the details right now in this interview, but that we would normally do. And I whispered to myself, he's about 15, 20 feet away across the hall. And I said, move to the left, just whispering to myself. Mm -hmm. And opened my eyes and I looked at him and he made a huge, not just a normal step, but a literal, almost a jump to the left. And I don't know what he was looking at. There was nothing over where he was at, but he made that move and the monitor was clear, the screen was clear, and I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And about 10 seconds and it dawned on me, what did I just do? Hmm. I'm not even in the dojo, because in the dojo, the training room, the karate club, that was normal to do. I expected to do that. But at this point, I said, here I am, manipulating someone that is not even conscious that I just manipulated them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started to hit me how many other people are being manipulated and doing things that they're not even aware. Mm -hmm. And so again, I'm not a Christian, mm -hmm. okay? I don't believe in God. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have any practices, any religious affiliation. But the first thing that came to my mind was I said, this guy, this has to be the devil. This is crazy. I can't, this can't be happening. And you didn't know who the devil was. <laughs> That's right. I didn't know who the devil was. And so. How did you know about the devil? You, you watched a movie? Yes. With, okay. So back when I was 10, 10 was a pivotal point for me. I watched this movie called uh, The Omen. Uh huh. And there in this movie was a little boy by the name of Damien. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, it had he had in his head, written on his head, the number 6666. I meant, it meant nothing to me. So at home, I, had, I was given a Bible about seven years previous. And it sat there with all my trophies. I had a dresser full of trophies and medals. I had a bookcase full of certificates, medals, and trophies. All from karate. All from karate. Okay. And there was this Bible. And Just, you never, never read I it. I never read it, never opened it. And I thought, I'm going to find out who Satan was. So one of the philosophies that we had in martial arts at the time was that if there's a problem, you deal with it right away because mm -hmm. you have to be progressive. Problem, solve it, move on. Problem, solve it, move on. I felt that what just happened to me or to this poor kid, I felt that this, this can't be right. It just, there's something about it. Again, I, again, I wasn't raised a Christian, mm -hmm. but it just didn't feel right that this should be happening. And I said, it's got to be the devil. <laughs> so, you know, it just in my naive mind, I went home, opened this Bible, and I remember in the, in the movie, it was in Revelation and so forth. So I finally fiddled through the whole book of Revelation. I found where it says, you know, 600 or six score or something. And I found it. And I was like, uh, but I was like, square one, it meant nothing to me. <laughs> so <laughs> no one could help you. <laughs> and no one could help me. There's no one I could talk to. I didn't know anyone, right? And my mother at this time had become a Christian, but... I, could, I, would, I couldn't even talk to her because I don't think anyone could relate mm. to, to, to my experience. Kind of like the blind leading the blind. Kind of like the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't. So, um, so strange enough, everywhere I went, I traveled with this Bible. Okay. From that day on, I had this Bible under my arm. It's a little blue Bible. And I had it with me. And a few weeks later, I'm not sure if it was the following Sunday, but a few Sundays later, my uncle and aunt, they had to go out of town and they asked me, can you cover the store for me again? Mm -hmm. And so this is where the turning point really happened. Um, so, oh, man, so many events. But up to this point, um, I said, sure, calendar was open. I was still involved in karate, never quit uh, at this point, but I just knew something wasn't right. The vibe wasn't right. Something wasn't right. And so I had this Bible under my arm and I um, this gentleman came by looking for my uncle. Mm -hmm. And he asked where my uncle was. I said, he's not here today. And uh, he looked at me and he said, are you a Christian? 
And I said, what? <laughs> Why would you ask me that? <laughs> like, wh what would give you such an idea? <laughs> like, he said, well, you have a Bible under your arm. <laughs> and I said, oh, this? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not a Christian. Does that mean I'm a Christian because I have a Bible? Is that what that means? And uh, he goes, well, <clears throat> Well, yeah. Well, why do you have the Bible? I said, well, funny you should ask me. I'm trying to find the devil. <laughs> as, as, as serious as a heart attack, that's just where I was. That's just where I was. You know, um, I'm trying to find... So he looked at me. And he said, oh. And then it had to be the Holy Spirit guiding this man. He said, have you ever heard of the Sabbath? Wow. And I went, hmm. Strange question. Strange question. Yeah. I said, Black Sabbath, yeah, I used to listen to them. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 <laughs> no. And then, and then he shifted again. And he said, have you ever heard of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Mm. So, you know, being, being in Ontario and, and, you know, all I know is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I said, hmm, Catholic Church. Baptist Church. I said, no, never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist, what is that? And he said, okay, okay. And then he shifted again. And he said to me, would you like to learn how to play the guitar? And I was blown away. Because he didn't know that was also one of my goals. Oh. That was another goal I had. I have a lot of goals. <laughs> My daytime. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I thought, this man's like me. He can read my mind, you see. Yeah. Because that's the level I was at. Mm -hmm. That if someone can connect with me, then they must have the ability to sense what I can sense, right? Because mm -hmm. I would do that with other people. Yeah. I would be able to pull out their thoughts, in, in a sense, in a way. And so he said to me, do you want to play the guitar? And I said, absolutely. Absolutely, I want to learn to play the guitar. And I don't know if I asked him if he, how he knew, but I was, I didn't, I was like, he connected right away. Mm -hmm. Then he said, by the way, if you come over, um, I, can, I can help you with that um, trying to find the devil situation. <laughs> I said, fine, when can we meet? You know, and, um, and that was kind of the beginning, a turning point. And uh, I found out later, I found out later with this gentleman that he, ha he was a part of a small group that were meeting together uh, on a regular basis, praying to find souls that needed to be found, mm. wow. praying for folks. Mm. And so I met with him and his family, and he started studying with me. Actually, he never studied with me. His wife did. But I explained to him in detail. Everything was fresh in my mind. I told him everything that had happened at the karate club as much as I could. And he basically told me that you can never go back. You can never go back there. And of course, that was my family, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I felt uh, it was, it, I was torn. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, if you go back, you'll die. And I said, I have to go back, and I have to go back for my bow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had gotten to weapons training, and so one of my weapon of, of choice was a bow. And I said, I have to go back to get my bow. And he said, well, no, you don't need it. You don't need to go back. And, and that was the last time. Uh, I have had a few contacts with a few of them over the years, many, many, many years later. But, but mm -hmm. I've stayed away from all of it. But the whole experience was, um, was just amazing to see how God led me through uh -huh. uh, this valley to bring me to this truth of knowing that I need to trust in Him yeah. and not in myself. And now you have a different perspective. Uh, you become a Christian. Yes. Uh, what from the scriptures can kind of help people as we close off today? Absolutely. You know, um, we touched on not trusting the armor flesh. Mm -hmm. And um, I find that uh, that trusting in God um, has, you know, I believe in a, a philosophy that we can find in the Bible called righteous by faith, mm -hmm. that our salvation our trust can be found in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, John 3.16 is a classic mm -hmm. one. You know, for God so loved the world mm -hmm. that He gave His only begotten mm -hmm. Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not mm -hmm. perish but have mm -hmm. everlasting life. And so that 
has been um, the mantra for me now versus the other mantras that I used to mm -hmm. I used to do mm -hmm. in martial arts. And this also kind of reminds me of um, Ephesians 6 verse 12. Mm -hmm. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, right? Um, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Absolutely. So it was a spiritual battle. Absolutely. And uh, and God has 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 uh, rescued you from that. Absolutely. But Ab before we let you go, Maurice, did you ever achieve your third goal of becoming a pilot? After many years of uh, taking ground school, uh, ground school was easy, many years of still flying, I had left karate and I had become a Christian. And on December 24th, um, I believe it was 91, I, I went solo mm -hmm. and uh, started flying. So mm -hmm. you achieved that goal too. <laughs> so I checked that off. <laughs> well, and so um, all things are possible with God. And, uh, and yeah, and so I feel that, um, you know, having these experiences has uh, given me the, the belief that if I trust in God, I can accomplish many more things and many more things for God. Mm -hmm. As we close off, can I ask you to have a word of prayer for us? Can you do that, Maurice? Okay. okay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for how you work in each one of our lives. I want to thank you so much for directing and for guiding. We know, Lord, that without you, we can't do anything good, but with you, Father, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. And so we thank you for how you've led in my life and each one of all our lives, because we all have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And so we thank you for your love and for your mercies, for we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Maurice, thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, and God truly gave you a gift when he gave you that Bible and that friend who came along. So That's thank right. you for sharing with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And friends, um, our gift for you today is called A Gift For You. And it is a free offer, a little booklet, and uh, get out a pen and paper or take it on your smartphone. And here's the details right now. To request today's offer, just log on to www.itiswrittencanada.ca. That's www.itiswrittencanada.ca. If you prefer, you may call toll-free at 1-888-CALL-IIW. That's 1-888-CALL-IIW. Or if you wish, you may write to us at It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H 7V4. And thank you for your prayer requests and your generous financial support. Friends, we just want to invite you to follow us on Instagram, on YouTube, Facebook, uh, on our website. And there you'll find all the material free of charge for you to look at any time because we want you to keep in mind the words of Jesus where he says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm.